Good evening. As some of you know, this evening's session is part of the Humanitarian Congress Berlin, uh, which will take place in the next two days. This humanitarian conference, organized by Médecins Sans Frontières, Médecins du Monde, the German Red Cross, the Berlin Chamber of Physicians, and the Charité Universitätsmedizin, offers a unique mix of uh, political keynote speeches and medical debates. This year's topic is No Access, Who Cares? How to Reach People in Need. And tonight, in order to guide us through the evening, let me introduce Carsten Luther. Carsten Luther, sitting over there, <laughs> is, <laughs> is a journalist and, photo and photographer. He studied politics, history, literature in Germany. He then went on to study European cultural studies and economics. He currently works at the leading German weekly newspaper Die Zeit as a foreign affairs editor. He also worked as a photographer for several NGOs and is a seasoned traveler. He has been kind enough to chair our kickoff event tonight. I hope you enjoy. Thank you very much. Small people. <laughs> All right. Okay, good evening again, and thanks for joining us for this special session opening this year's Humanitarian Congress in Berlin. This evening is open to the general public and free of charge, so I got some hope that this crowd not only consists of uh, humanitarian professionals, uh, medical or logistics experts, and the like. Um, I already spotted some friends who would make for perfectly unbiased listeners because they have nothing to do with humanitarian endeavors whatsoever. And given today's theme, distant suffering, which will access to the war zone, there might be more than a few photographers and journalists around who usually make for some of the more discerning audiences. Anyway, whatever your background, let me ask one thing of you tonight, just be as open-minded as my friends. The overarching theme of this year's Congress, as you've already heard, is no access, who cares? How to reach people in need. But tonight we will focus on a different angle, not how to bring help to suffering people, but how their suffering is, is visually communicated in the media. We will take a look at how humanitarians, through their communicative practices and photographers, have utilized images from distant conflicts and crises in the past, and how the representation of distant suffering has changed in recent years. Pictures can elicit strong emotional responses. And at this time, I'm thankful to have humanitarian professionals of all kinds in the audience, because you all know, though only some will admit it, that people are not necessarily driven to help or donate by a comprehensive understanding of the complex proceedings of humanitarian aid, but in general by emotions like pity, sympathy, or even guilt. I would even tend to say that in developed countries, people still look at developing countries mainly in categories of poor, miserable, disastrous, and this is where the problem begins. Aid organizations are tempted to utilize images for marketing and advocacy purposes that fit and reflect these categories because the public responds to it. It seems to me as a market-driven system, so kind of an economy of compassion that further reinforces stereotypes. And for photographers, these are generally the easy pictures to take because they sell. And this might be true not only in a humanitarian context, but for media in general. Some time ago, even the, the term disaster porn or uh, poverty point has been coined for this. You will have a hard time looking for alternatives, whatever your profession, photographer, journalist, or humanitarian professional, and it's getting even worse over the years, which brings me to our first speaker of this evening. I would like to introduce to you Lily Chuliaraki. She's professor of media and communications at the London School of Economics, where her main interest where her main research interest lies in the mediation of human vulnerability. She has spent the past 10 years exploring three key domains in which human vulnerability appears as a problem of communication, that is disaster news, humanitarianism, and war. 
In her field, she has published an extensive amount of scientific articles, as well as several books, which include Discourse in Late Modernity, The Spectatorship of Suffering, and this is the late show moment where I have to show the book, <laughs> uh, The Ironic Spectator, Solidarity in the Age of Post-Humanitarianism. Currently, she works on a manuscript on the changing iconographies of war in the past hundred years. So, let us hear what she has to say on the spectacles of suffering and how solidarity has become ironic over the years. One hint, it is much more about us than about others suffering. Uh, to be here. I need to um, come out of this and get on my own presentation. Is this? Yeah, sure. If we can go up. Thank you. So, um, as you've just heard, my work is uh, very much um, focused on uh, the question of human vulnerability as a problem of communication. And I have explored that theme in a number of um, different research projects and ultimately uh, book publications. Uh, so, what I'm going to do today is present uh, if you like, a, a distillation or a crystallization of some of this work. And I'm going to uh, do so by exploring uh, four uh, rep uh, representational patterns through which uh, vulnerability becomes a certain kind of uh, spectacle. And how, in becoming a certain kind of spectacle, uh, vulnerability puts forward and legitimizes specific proposals for solidarity. And just to make uh, the conceptual terrain clear here, I define solidarity in the broadest possible way as the moral imperative to act on vulnerable others, an imperative that stems from the urgency of um, of the suffering body as it is being depicted in multiple forms in, in um, uh, different uh, modes of uh, public communication. So here are the questions that I am addressing uh, today. How do the various iconographies of suffering resolve the problem of uh, representing suffering and vulnerability? Um, and the two uh, sub-questions that I am uh, addressing in the course of the talk are how do um, iconographies of suffering represent the human body in need in a way that is morally acceptable and politically efficacious, but also which discourses or proposals of solidarity and social change, if at all, do these iconographies propose? Um, so, as I'm going to argue, uh, vulnerability as a problem of communication is not easily resolved. It is perhaps, we can say, an unresolvable problem. And one of the reasons why uh, it is not easy to resolve the problem of representing suffering others uh, in pictures or moving image is because that kind of representation is always caught up in the ethics and politics of global power relations, and specifically in the hierarchical division between West, the West and the global South. However, that difficulty to resolve the problem of representation, that impossibility, at least for now, to come out of these systemic structures of power should not make us despair, and this is 
my uh, second, if you like, uh, message from this talk today. We should insist on problematizing and challenging the ways in which we represent distant others, and we should always reflect on the ways in which this problem of representation has been resolved in time. And this is because we learn from these representations, and we can always, in learning, try and um, attempt to uh, represent otherwise, represent alternatively, try to address the problems uh, that have been there before. Every single representational practice, I, I argue, in, in the book and, and beyond, has something important to tell us about how we imagine the world beyond ourselves and how we imagine our relationship to distant others. And every single representational practice affords, as a consequence, also uh, different proposals uh, of solidarity. So let us examine in some more detail um, those uh, proposals. And uh, what I'm presenting you with here is a kind of an overview of the typology of the communication of suffering that I have come up with. Uh, as I said, I'm going to talk to you about three uh, historical and one more contemporary way of representing uh, distant suffering. I start with uh, uh, perhaps the most uh, well-established and the most traditional uh, modality of representation, suffering as bare life. And by suffering as bare life, I refer to the presentation of the body in its kind of biological truth, as a body that is in need, that is in pain. Um, and I take that term from uh, the Italian philosopher Giorgio Agamben, who is using bare life to signify precisely uh, the uh, idea of the body as um, a biological entity as opposed to a social or civic entity. And I associate uh, the representation of suffering as bare life with a particular proposal of solidarity, what I will elaborate uh, in a minute as a solidarity of neocolonialism. I then move on to uh, the representational pattern of suffering as tender-heartedness, um, which is associated with what we might broadly call a solidarity of salvation. And the suffering as standard heartedness refers to representations that are inside empathetic emotion towards suffering others. Uh, I move on to suffering um, as uh, indignation, whereby the focus is not so much on the suffering body as a source of tender heartedness or as a pure biological um, entity, but the focus now is on the evil doer, doer, on the dictator, on the tyrant, on the oppressor against whom people are, um, uh, are protesting um, and whose authority people are challenging. So they are reclaiming their vulnerability in a, in a different way. And I associate that kind of iconography of suffering with what we might call a solidarity of revolution. And finally, I move on to a more contemporary style of representation, uh, what is also implied in the title of my book as uh, The Ironic Spectator, the ironic mode of representing distant suffering, uh, what we might also call the modality of suffering as self-reflexivity, which brings with it precisely the uh, proposal of solidarity as irony. So let me uh, not waste any more time with the preliminaries um, and let me move on to the first category, solidarity as uh, suffering as bare life. Uh, so here is some um, of the, uh, if you like, early uh, characteristic uh, images that put forward the claim of suffering as a biological uh, fact. Um, here we have something from 1984. It comes from the BBC report on uh, uh, the Korem camp in Ethiopia. Um, and there is a, a few things that I would like to uh, draw your attention to, a few kind of properties, if you like, of those images that make them um, uh, very specific uh, representations of, of suffering in terms of bare life. 
So the question is, what are the properties of these images? How is vulnerability staged here? Um, the first thing we can say about these images is that they rely on photorealism, a photorealism of suffering. We see real people and we see real people uh, in a condition of, of destitution, emaciation. The visual focus is uh, a focus on the body in pain. And this is a passive body. It is inactive, it is waiting for things to happen, it is unaware of the camera. I'm sure you've heard all this before. It is part of the main critique of what I will in a minute call uh, neocolonial uh, solidarity. Another feature is massification, that people are always presented in groups, that there is no singularization, no focus on individuals. Um, we might also say that some of these pictures, particularly this one, um, is characterized by what cultural critic Stuart Hall terms uh, fetishization, which is um, uh, a term referring to the body uh, as a reified entity, as an object of fascination. And we can see here how the protruding ribs, the nakedness, in a way invites a, a curious um, uh, a curious attitude on behalf of the camera, on behalf of the spectator. Uh, now, what kind of gaze does that, does that kind of uh, iconography produce and invite? And I would say it invites a gaze of guilt and shame. Um, and um, as Stan Cohen, in his seminal work on humanitarian uh, representation called States of Denial, um, they pose the question, what could I have done that I haven't? Uh, if at all, of course, we all know the problems that this kind of representation has caused, and one of them is numbness. And, but uh, still, as a picture, as a staging of vulnerability, uh, the gaze is a gaze of guilt, and the question is, is it me? Am I responsible? What could I have done? And here is a summary of what I've just uh, described um, in, <clears throat> as the key characteristics of the iconography of bare life. Now, what is the form of solidarity that is associated with this iconography then? First of all, this is a, a, an, early, uh, uh, an early representational pattern uh, for uh, staging suffering and, and vulnerability. Uh, you saw the dates on, on the images. It is, it is a style that still uh, exists today, it coexists with different styles, uh, but it is perhaps associated mostly with the first years after uh, decolonization. Um, it is associated also, uh, it, is, it, it, it produces a mode of solidarity, what we might call a solidarity of urgency and, and, and aid, of emergency aid, that focuses primarily on saving lives but uh, keeps away from providing a systemic account of the causes of vulnerability themselves. It is also solidarity that in construing non-Western lives as radically different from ours, as biological bodies but not civic or, or social bodies, it reproduces a colonial imagination depriving these lives of their own agency, their own sovereignty. This form of solidarity, in other words, provides um, support, provides assistance, provides aid, but at a certain cost, and that's an important cost. This is what Roger Silverstone, one of my uh, colleagues at, at the London School of Economics, has called the annihilation of vulnerable others, the annihilation of their uh, of their own distinct humanity. Now, if this kind of iconography then has been criticized uh, so um, intensely and so uh, broadly uh, in relevant literature and in the public debate, what has come to replace it, or at least to ameliorate its negative uh, implications? This is the kind of iconography uh, that seems to be emerging around the mid-80s. 
and which um, tries quite drastically to move away from the impasses of, of the first uh, modality of representation. So what are the properties here then? What do we have here? We have a different photorealism. We still rely on representation of or the photographic representation of distant others. But here we have not a photorealism of suffering, we have a photorealism of hope. Smiles, there is no pain. The visual focus is on the healthy body, particularly the bodies of children. And it is a body that acts. It is not a passive body, it is playful, It takes initiatives. It looks straight at us. And that idea of the gaze as an action, a gaze that engages rather than lingers on off camera, points to another characteristic of these, of these um, uh, iconographies, which is individuation. As opposed to the massification of earlier campaigns, what we have here is individuals engage, inviting engagement through the way in which they look at us, but also through their numbers, their singulars. There are, there, there are a few children here on, the, on, the, on your um, left, but otherwise we have individuals um, who are um, looking straight at us. Some of them are also intensely personalized, so we have names, we have contexts very often. There is a narrative in a way that frames those images, uh, in particular discourses of action. What kind of gaze is being produced here? A gaze of um, reciprocity and gratitude. There is a balance between the tender-hearted donor who engages with those individuals and the grateful receiver. What kind of solidarity have, can, we, um, can we assume to be um, uh, invoked uh, here? We might say again that this is a, a solidarity of, uh, of aid, but in a broader sense uh, than the solidarity that we encountered in the previous, um, in the previous neocolonial imagination. It is a solidarity of aid and development. Uh, that whilst it doesn't offer a radical critique of the systemic causes of uh, suffering, it expands the demand for solidarity beyond saving lives. It is not just about uh, uh, a bed for the night. Uh, it is also about sustaining livelihoods, it's about offering conditions and resources through which people can actually make small changes in their everyday lives. That kind of solidarity, however, has also become a focus of critique. And one of the critiques that have been voiced against it is that this is a solidarity that in asserting the similarities between Western and non-Western lives, it deprives those lives of their historical specificity and their legitimate difference. This is what my colleague uh, Roger Silverstone, in a contradistinction to the annihilation of distant suffering that we see here, calls an appropriation of, of the difference of these sufferers. These are people who live radically different lives to ours. And the reason why they are being represented is so that we can offer our assistance and help, be that donation, signature or whatever. Why are they represented just like us? Again, Stanley Cohen puts, um, uh, uh, puts the point very well when he says that the question that is being asked of us in this kind of... Uh, solidarity is um, uh, the, the question that we can ask by being confronted with that is well how different are they and if they are just like me then why should I help of course those doubts and and this uh, kind of um, uh, discourse of suspicion that these images um, uh, produce 
is a classical example of what Pierre Bourdieu, the sociologist, has called misrecognition. This iconography, in fact, conceals through euphemism um, systemic power relations through the images of, of, of smiling children. And so the solidarity of uh, salvation that comes about um, as a uh, kind of implication, if you like, of this iconography also runs into impasses that are very difficult to overcome. Let me now move on to uh, a third iconography of suffering, what we might call suffering as indignation. And I have here put pictures from the mid-60s. Um, uh, this is a filmic representation of, um, of the demand uh, for action on, on vulnerability and suffering from the anti-colonial struggle of uh, uh, Algeria. This is the classic film by Gillo Pontecorvo, The Battle of Algiers. We can see a similar iconography in, um, in uh, the other uh, picture, which comes uh, 45 years later, and it is from Tahrir Square. We can see another style of representing uh, vulnerability and suffering as indignation, which is the singular individual against uh, a mass of uh, uh, police or army forces. And we have a picture from uh, May 68 in Paris, and again, uh, more recently from the Arab Spring. So, um, what are then the properties of this particular style of um, uh, staging, distant others? First of all, the difference from the previous two forms is that we now have collective compositions, we have long shots. It is a photorealism, again, because we see the real people in their physical context. But we now have a photorealism of violence. There is a confrontational configuration of participants in, in these pictures, be that uh, the individual against the crowd or large masses of people <coughs> against uh, an army. The visual focus, therefore, is not on one person or a mass of anonymous passive bodies, but it is um, a focus on um, collective or individual bodies as metonymies, as standing for whole classes, social classes, or whole groups of people who are brought together because of the cause that unites them. They stand, for instance, for their anti-colonial struggle or uh, as um, groups of freedom fighters. The focus, again, is not on a particular gaze. It is not on a particular uh, emaciated body. It is on space and the dynamics of space. It is an inclusive, open-ended, horizontal space, expansive, but always divided. It is us and them, or, or the two sides uh, facing one another. The gaze that is invited here by uh, those who witness those scenes is a gaze of affiliation and conflict at the same time. Affiliation because we are invited perhaps to, um, to express our uh, solidarity with the members of the protesting multitudes and conflict with the state power or the forces of, of, of oppression that are being represented in those pictures. So what is the form of solidarity, we might say, that is being invoked or invited through these images? Um, I would say that this is a solidarity of revolution, a solidarity that focuses on uh, systemic accounts of the causes of vulnerability and advocates, either explicitly or implicitly, the radical transformation of these structural inequalities for instance, in post-colonial struggles in the mid-60s, uh, more recently in anti-globalization movements, and of course with the Arab Spring against the um, 
uh, oppressive regimes of the, uh, of the countries in question. Is, however, the solidarity of revolution an unproblematic form of solidarity? We tend to romanticize revolution, and we always want, of course, to be with the right side, with the side of the revolutionaries. Um, however, as we know, this is also a solidarity that has been under attack. It is also a solidarity that has disillusioned uh, um, large uh, parts of, of the population of the West and beyond the West, of course. It is a solidarity that has often itself perpetuated structural inequalities and it has legitimized its own projects of power. Moreover, it has lost currency, particularly with the fall of uh, grand narratives, of the big narratives of social change, like, for example, uh, socialism and communism. And more recently, with the Arab Spring, we saw new narratives emerging in a different part of the world, motivating people to, to overthrow regimes and change their lives. And we are seeing again a wave of um, uh, dissatisfaction, new impasses perhaps, new difficulties to establish a new order that would live up to the dreams of um, uh, a solidarity uh, as a revolution. New power relations take the place of the old ones and uh, the dreams do not seem to be um, coming true. So, so here are some of the um, characteristics of the solidarity of revolution, which I'm summing up. I've just explained it to you. And I'm now moving on to actually sum up what I've said so far before I move on to the final part of the talk. So what does this typology tell us? As I mentioned um, um, in my introduction, vulnerability as a problem of communication has not and cannot be adequately resolved in its key categories of um, iconographical representation so far. And to summarize, we have one argument against the solidarities of bare life and salvation, that they either annihilate or appropriate distant sufferers, Basically, those solidarities that are based on the conviction that we can make a difference in the lives of others, we can help them improve their everyday lives, show, in fact, that there is no pure benevolence and that the humanitarian project, in its representational level, as well as its institutional and financial and operational level, is um, entangled in constant power struggles and creates its own hierarchies of uh, human life. Um, the argument also against the solidarities of revolution is that grand narratives of social change have not eliminated injustice. That somehow the West still dominates the world order and the decolonized South is still subordinate and dependent. And more recently, with the Arab Spring, even those who are trying to change uh, uh, their uh, existing regimes will be entangled in new perpetual um, struggles of power that cannot be done away with, with the simplicity and, if you like, romanticism of those stereotypical representations that we are so used to seeing in, um, in, uh, in public life. So where do we go from here? And there is one person who I think has summed up the contemporary dilemma, representational dilemma of humanitarianism, and that is Luke Boltanski in his book Distant Suffering, Politics, Morality and the Media who formulates the question as follows. He says, why is it so difficult nowadays to become indignant and to make accusations, or in another sense, to become emotional and feel sympathy, or at least to believe for any length of time without falling into uncertainty in the validity 
of one's indignation or one's own sympathy. And it is precisely as a response to this question that a new mode, I think, of representing distant suffering and a new style of solidarity has come up, to which I now turn. And this uh, form of solidarity, which is the focus of, of um, uh, the ironic spectator, is, a, solid, is, a, is, a, is a, um, a form of representation and a mode of solidarity uh, that stems precisely from that impossibility of representing vulnerability as something that can be inspired by grand visions or grand emotions. Anger, indignation, tender-heartedness. Um, and therefore, brings forward a mode of solidarity that cannot possibly um, take its moral imperative from outside um, ourselves and our own truths, but falls back on, on us, our thoughts, our desires, uh, our wishes, in order to inspire us to be solidary. And here is an example of that. I don't know how many of you might have um, come across um, uh, this um, appeal by Action 8, but it is really an interactive quiz. It's all online. It's called Find Your Feeling. And when you click on the Start Now, you are being uh, confronted with four or five different images. Let's say an image of two women hugging, a child swinging uh, in a playground, um, a, a child in Africa gazing intensely at the camera, etc., etc. And then you are asked to pick your choice of these, out of these images. And depending on the choice you make in two or three different um, web pages, then your profile is being configured and your personality characteristic is, is, appears on, on the screen. So you can be, for example, warm and fluffy, or <laughs> that's the one that really stuck with me, because I think that's what I ended up being, sadly. Um, <laughs> but I think, that, you know, there's other um, characterizations like, like this. It's a kind of a psychologization of the donor, really. It's a way of luring you into um, actually engaging with a website of a major brand through a focus on you. A bit of a narcissistic focus on who am I and how do I really um, experience solidarity feelings, yeah? And here is another one. It's the Oxfam 2008 um, campaign called Be Humankind. One of the appeals of this campaign is actually online and I would like to show it to you. It's, it will only take like 40 seconds or something. I have to find it first, of course. Oh, it's here, there. How different is that from what we had seen before? Think about the 60s, think about, can't see anything, think about, um, I've done something wrong. All right. Oh. Sorry about that. Yes, here we are. So, um, yes, how different that is from what we've seen earlier. 
And what a long way we've gone from the images of emaciated children with their naked protruding ribs. Um, so let us just focus a little bit on, on the iconography of, of this type of campaigns. First of all, I think the key thing here is that we move away from photorealism altogether, because these are not real people and they are not there in their physical environment. This is a very self-conscious aesthetic. It is a kind of textual game through which proposals for solidarity are being put forward. So the focus now is on a playful interactivity or on cartoon narratives. There is no justification for action. There's nothing that we see of what is happening with those people out there that would motivate us to act. There is also another major difference. The space in which these are located is the space of Western safety. It's our space, it's not their space. And so the people we are confronted with, like the elderly uh, senior citizen here, is, is people like us. Um, distant others are marginalized. They appear in this uh, little clip we saw here. They just appear as uh, words on the newspapers or as images in a television within the, within the, um, uh, within the appeal. We have another important change as well. We have the introduction of uh, interactivity. So when the, um, well, with the action aid, of course, um, interactivity is the whole way through which you engage with the campaign. And here you are asked to click on Oxfam's um, website and engage with um, their proposals for solidarity there. <clears throat> But this is, one might say, that kind of interactivity is a kind of click and donate form of um, activism, a fleeting commitment that makes you feel uh, good about doing this. So um, let me conclude um, by um, just making a couple of comments on this form of solidarity. And, and then putting forward a few questions that I think would be worth exploring together in the panel and then with you. Um, what I think we are experiencing here is a profound shift in the communicative basis of the humanitarian field, away from the moral gravitas of the body in need towards our own truths and our own everyday realities as a guarantee for action on, on suffering and as, if you like, a trigger for action on, on, on distant suffering. <clears throat> and it is precisely this return to the self as the anchoring point of solidarity that makes that kind of solidarity ironic. And I use the term irony along the lines of the American uh, pragmatist philosopher Richard Rorty, who's done a fantastic book called um, uh, irony, contingency, solidarity, already in 1989, where his dream was that in order to, um, to be solidar to distant others, uh, we wouldn't really um, need to believe in big ideas, we wouldn't really need to um, act in a sacrificial way. All we would need to do is just try to be better people try to somehow um, uh, connect with the world in a benevolent manner. And in our small ways, we can make a difference to whatever touches us around us. Now, what I think was a dream in his philosophical utopia in 1989 has become the reality, and I don't think it is so utopian, in humanitarian communication in 2013 in the sense that this kind of communication takes its point of departure on precisely those everyday small truths of each one of us, leaves distant others completely outside, 
leaves their voice, their presence, their needs outside the frame of communication, also marginalizes the question of justification, the question of why should we be acting on a particular cause, what are the reasons for that, and what could be a, a bigger, if you like, um, reason for acting in a solidary way with distant others, and in so doing, it impoverishes, in my view, and reduces um, the field of possible emotions, possible actions, and possible commitments to distant uh, others. Of course, I understand that this form of solidarity is um, a solidarity that responds to the impasses of the three modes that we've seen before. And it recognizes, in other words, the limits of its own legitimacy and efficacy. But perhaps um, it does so in a way that has a bigger cost than it has a benefit. First of all, it engages us to, um, to a perpetual quest for feeling good but offers no moral discourse, no moral reasons on why it is important to act. It also invites fleeting commitments, and the media, of course, new media, the digital media play an important role here. Fleeting commitments on our part, on specific small causes, without offering us any sustained engagement with the bigger questions of politics, ethics, and otherness. Who are these people? Why are they suffering? What can I do for them? How are they different from me? Uh, what I also do in my work, which I'm not doing here, but I hope that this will come up in the discussion, is that I am exploring three types of reasons as to why this change has come about. How our solidarity became from neocolonial too ironic. And these are, well, I've mentioned the new media as uh, the technological change that has radicalized new forms of engagement through the internet. Uh, the second is, again, I mentioned it, politics. We don't have the big, big narratives of solidarity that used to nurture our uh, collective imaginations in the past, of revolution or salvation. The third one, of course, is um, institutional uh, reason, and that has to do with the commercialization, the marketization of the field of um, aid and development itself. The uh, proliferation of organizations, their competition for uh, what is necessarily a limited budget has, I think, um, pushed those organizations um, into um, a set of practices that resemble more the corporate world rather than uh, the humanitarian field as it used to be. And part of the corporatization of marketization of the field is of course the, um, the um, adoption of corporate forms of um, communication, branding, as ActionAid and Oxfam are doing now. But I will leave these questions here because this is not really the focus of my, of my talk. And I will put up the questions that I think would be worth talking about. I will leave these questions with you. I'm not going to read them out. And thank you very much for your attention. Hello. Okay, thank you, Lily. Let me start by first introducing our other participants. Um, literally jumped in in the last minute uh, is Anna Karin Moden uh, from Medicine Sans Frontières uh, in Sweden, where she's currently a senior communications advisor um, on external communications and advocacy. Um, she's been working with communications in MSF since 2005, mostly focusing on the Swedish media and public but also served as a communications advisor for MSF field projects. 
And before joining MSF, she was a press and information officer for the UK humanitarian organization Merlin, based in Sri Lanka and Indonesia. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah, it is working. And, and thank you for um, a very informative and very, very interesting talk. I think it's important for humanitarian organizations to take a step back and really listen to this kind of discussions. Uh, because I realized when I was sitting here that um, part of what I do is communicate suffering. I haven't thought about it that way, but it's part of the job. It's also part of the job is also to communicate um, hope and, and the, the change that, that actually does happen also. So, but part of it is, I guess, then communicating suffering. And um, uh, I th it, it is, I said, it's important to, to think about what we do, and, and we do. Uh, we discuss it in our organizations, and actually, just yesterday or the day before, uh, at MSF Sweden, we finished a, an analysis of the pictures that we've been using, the imagery, over the past three years, just to kind of see where have we, what, what have we been doing, so that we can use that as a basis uh, for discussing what do we want to be, how do we want to portray the people that we work with, uh, how do we want to portray ourselves, uh, and so have to, to have a basis for that reflection. I'll, I'll come back a little bit to that later. Uh, but I just wanted to mention uh, a little bit about the, the work or the mandates of, of MSF. Uh, medical aid, of course, is, is the first one, what we do, but we also have another mandate which is uh, to inform uh, and to, to speak about what we see uh, in the field. And this is a goal in itself, uh, to, to spread information. We, we do it and to, yeah, to inform. So uh, I would say that MSF is an organization that thinks quite a bit about uh, what, who we are and what we want to do and how, what kind of images we want to, to use, but I think we could, of course, be better. Uh, one of the ways that we, a very conscious way that we decided to work is that we don't use celebrities like a lot of other organizations do. We, we, we've decided to, to do to work in other ways, but it's a conscious decision. Um, maybe I will go back a little bit to this analysis, and it's only for imagery that MSF Sweden has used in our own channels, on our website, in our magazine, uh, in our Facebook channel, and in donor letters. So it's not at all representative of all of MSF, it's just a little snapshot of, uh, of what we've been doing. Uh, and. Um, what we saw then is that most of the pictures that were analyzed show actual medical work. Uh, and in these pictures, uh, about um, half and half are show international staff and the other half uh, local, local staff. So we were, I was quite relieved that, that it sh the analysis showed this because it's something that we've tried to be better at, to not only show uh, Western doctors helping suffering children in Africa, uh, and we've been doing that a bit more consciously. Uh, so I'm sure we could, we could definitely do more of that, but I was kind of happy about that analysis. Uh, then we said that the other big um, group of people that we, well, when, when you come to look at pictures of, of people and kind of portraits, 60% of them are of patients. Uh, according to the analysis, and 22% of them are on international staff and 12% on local staff. I think we could do better with the local staff, absolutely. Uh, but I would still say that a lot of, a lot of the pictures are of patients. Uh, we, uh, the, the classification is that most of them are neutral. They don't show crying or object suffering, and a lot of them don't also show um, a lot of happiness. Uh, most of them are, are neutral. Uh, but I did see in the analysis now, and I've just started looking at it, that you could see a bit of a tendency to show uh, more staff, more local staff, and more international staff, maybe then a few or less patients. 
that's something that we will bring, bring with us. And although I said the most of the pictures that we use are neutral, uh, a few more now are positive than they, than they were in 2011. So something that we will bring, bring with us. Um, I also wanted to say something about um, social media and the possibilities of social media. Uh, and, and maybe first just something about that there, there's a lot of communication going out from these organizations anymore. And these, these examples were, were just some of them. Um, uh, I, I invite everyone to, to have a look at all the communication that Oxfam does and see if you can kind of try to, to make your, your own opinion about what, what kind of communications they, they do. I'm not an expert. Oxfam does not exist in Sweden. But um, I, I, one of the challenges that we, that we have is, as communication people is to, to come up with new things all the time, to, to show new, new, to have new campaigns and, and, and a new, new ways to, to show the, the work that we do. Uh, but anyways, going back to, to the new possibilities of, of social media, um, I think if we use it the right way, it's a huge, it's a, it's a great opportunity to be able to kind of create that link between I, that you were talking about, the, the, the us here, or me, and them, the, the people that we're, we're trying to, to help. Um, I, I also think that when we work with social media, it's really important that we that we keep these kinds of things in mind that, that you were speaking about. And uh, that we should also be aware that social media is, by definition, uh, something that is about I, or me, myself, my own identity, uh, and uh, what I think of them, the, the people that... Uh, you, you decide to share information about, uh, and um, to be keep that in mind when, when we as humanitarian organizations work with this medium. Uh, and I think that you have to find a balance within when you when you use it. Uh, it cannot only be about the donor or the person looking. It has to be about the people that you look at or that you try to help. Uh, without making them objects or passive or so forth. And I think that there's a lot of potential within social media in this way. Uh, and we will try to, to explore that and use that in the future. Uh, and you also try, have to try to give people um, that want to be informed about your work some sort of hope, because it is possible to make a difference. Uh, it makes a difference that, that people know about this and you have to kind of work in the way in the most effective ways to get people to, to listen about listen and to, to learn more about what the situation are in places where there's where there is suffering uh, so that people can have the energy to to keep engaged and keep keep involved in this so you have to be a bit pragmatic too MSF is, is quite good at being pragmatic in, in in the field so we we need to be pragmatic but you have to also keep the the ideals uh, at, I mean, you have, you have to keep that. So you have to try to find a balance between uh, in, in, in the work when you do communicate this. Um, I think I will stop there. I'm sure we can have a dis <laughs> interesting discussion further on. Yeah, thank you. Um. <laughs> Just one quick question with a short answer. <laughs> Um, in your analysis, you found out that most of the pictures were neutral. What defines neutral? What makes a photo neutral in our I context? Think, I think that in the analysis, it was maybe when there was no crying or, you know, a, very, a, a big expression and there was no laughter, then they were a bit in the middle. And of course, most pictures would be like that. Okay. Yeah. But in your, in your daily work, would you recognize photos uh, falling into these categories, these uh, Categories as Lily just presented. Sorry. Um, in your daily work, you choose photos for, for communicating suffering, as you yeah. put it. Um, did you recognize any of these categories? Yes. All of them. Uh, yes, and I think that the, the very emaciated um, suffering people, we moved away from that. It's not acceptable anymore to communicate that kind of imagery. 
uh, as, a, as an aid organization. In the media, that's, that's fine, but not as an aid organization as much. And, and we don't use those kinds of imagery in Sweden anyways, that much. Um, let me introduce... No, let me, <laughs> nothing, nothing like the, the first picture. I mean, that's just not okay to use that kind of, kind of imagery. In the media, it's okay. I got that, yeah. <laughs> okay, just let me introduce Isabel Ashragi, um, born in Iran, of a French mother and an Iranian father. She's a photographer who worked a lot for international French magazines and also uh, for different NGOs like Doctors of the World and Action Against Hunger, Amnesty International, in a whole lot of countries. And she worked a lot of, uh, on women issues. And um, she might have to say a few words about how to take a neutral photo. No. Um, we've heard some... We've heard about some, some radical misrepresentations. Yeah, all these, all these um, categories, I think, have in common that they are misrepresenting the, the suffering others. Yeah, there's something missing. Um, did you ever uh, think about something like that when taking photos? What do you want your photos to represent? So most of the time when I work with NGOs, I go on the fields and I have to bring back them picture for the communication. So this is I'm um, trying to be the best messenger I can between them and the large public. But uh, most of the time, I see the suffering <laughs> by the rain front, and I take picture of that. But when I bring back, sometimes you know they have to to make it the way that it's not going to be disturbing the large public. So they choose me also sometimes because I, I'm going to show you some just one picture I did. It was one of the. Sometimes the, the subject on the field is not easy, so I had to go in Pakistan. Um, it was uh, for a mission called Smile Again, where the, the doctor, they repaired the face of the burning woman. So it's very easy to make very strong picture, as one of my colleagues, Jodi Bieber, did when she won the World Press. It was a picture on the cover of Times. So she took really the front face picture, and it was... Times cover and WordPress. So I tried, in all these girls, there was one happy story. Uh, she, he, she had the burning face from her last husband, and one of the, the cousins of her, he decided to get married with her, and now it was, the, I think, the fifth operation. And um, so that's one of the pictures I brought back, and, and we published it. It was uh, after the suffering. So you, you can see the guy next to her is the second husband, and it's very not usual to find an husband after when you got this story happened to you. But okay, we can see her burning face. She will be better, and that's one of the pictures that I like to do. But I like also to have the front face picture to see this to show the suffering so I do both I do one in one bag <laughs> I take front picture and in other bag I try to to, to take all the pictures not too difficult to accept so just to go back to to Lily's talk I, I would just wanted to show these pictures from this one campaign from action against anger they did in France, and um, okay, so object in mirror are closer than they appear. So you can see, you know, it's really a street in Paris, Avenue de l'Opéra, and they use the mirror. There is also another campaign they did on the bicycle that you can rent, you know, for in Paris, and also in the mirror of the bicycle, they put a picture of one of the, the, the suffering people and so it's interesting for me because they bring back from far away the pictures in the, the tools of daily life of the westerners. So this is for as a photographer that we have to be in the balance between the request from uh, the communication and the 
let's say, to respect also the feeling of the large public, but uh, also um, the main thing is always to tell my image the truth. Voila, I'm <laughs> not going to spend too much time. Um, are there any requests that you turned down because they were not acceptable, and why? You said the, 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 requests, from, the requests from NGOs. Yeah? Have mm -hmm. you ever turned down requests because they were not acceptable, and why? Mm, no, no, I always say yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Freelance photographer. No, yes. no, sometimes it's not easy. Sometimes it's post-war effect. I had to work on one of, one of the things also was on Bosnian women, the survivors of uh, the war in Bosnia. And that was quite difficult because, okay, it was 10 years after the war. So I was sitting with them, drinking coffee with them, smoking cigarettes with them. But I said, what am I going to make? Picture, you know, I don't know what can I bring because this is the story from the past. And I have to show it now. So finally, uh, I decide to bring um, a, a big white panels, and I make portrait with the roller flex. And you can feel in all the portrait I did a big mosaic with all these faces, and you can feel in their eyes, in the ways they smoke the cigarette, in the ways they put them. You can feel that they had suffering a lot. But that was another, you know, just to try to figure out the suffering past until now, because it's still suffering in their mind, not visual around them, but you have to bring a picture to, to show that also. Did you ever think about what kind of solidarity uh, your pictures would propose, like we just heard? Mm, sorry? <laughs> um, <laughs> did you ever think about what kind of solidarity your pictures would propose like we just heard in these categories. Yeah, yeah, usually I think in the proposed photorealism is the main, uh, the main um, uh, tools, I think. <laughs> okay. uh? But you said you were looking for, for, for a happy story, for, for something positive. Now, one, what I was wondering also, what is interesting for me sometimes, um, the humanitarian, we communicate on the suffering on the days, right now, these days, but sometimes, you know, after finishing one, one mission in one field, uh, usually, you know, we don't know what's going to happen then. And uh, there is never image or um, stories about what happened after giving help to this population. What happened, you know, after this time, okay, this is the hurry of these days. They go to another, uh, another country to, to, to show what's happening, to, to put image and iconic image or so. But sometimes it could be interesting to go back and to, to show also what happened after. Nobody knows, you know, and it's really uh, underrepresented in the communication and maybe even for the people who, who, did, ha who did give some assistance, you know, to know now, these days, how they live, how they look like. Mm -hmm. So you worked for, for, for uh, several agencies um, or, or for several NGOs who directly commissioned your work, but you also uh, sell your work to just whoever wants to use it. Um, I think when you when you check later what your photos have been used for, which stories or, or which which campaigns, maybe um, is there any um, any guilt on your side? No, no, no. I, mean, no, I, mean, no, I, mean, no I, I will not say guilt because the picture I do is like a, a painter or writer. I did it, so I and I didn't uh, as a working. Um, what didn't say for a médecin du monde in 2000, I do it as a volunteer photographer, you know? So um, I work as a photojournalist on other issues. So um, when you act, you take the picture. At that time, you have to think if you feel guilty or not. It's not after when it's published. Mm -hmm. It's uh, when you're acting and when you shoot. 
most um, important time. Did it ever happen that a photo of yours um, had been used for something you wouldn't like to? Uh, no, I have the chance to be a part of an agency um, and the archives, they are very, res uh, they've really taken care of the pictures and they don't never give the picture, to, you know, to sell it in another purpose that it has been done. Mm -hmm. So we, I, I am and they are very careful also for that, because of, of course. Uh, but I can say that this picture for the wedding ceremony, and it's not wedding ceremony, it looks like a wedding ceremony of this burning um, young Pakistani girls. I use it for a book. I publish it on woman um, issue in the Middle East, and it was in the part of love. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> there was a lot of love story, but I put this one in love story. So I bring it outside of the context, but the story was a st love story when I did it. So it was a sad story and a love story at the same time. Nothing wrong about love stories. <laughs> <laughs> so Lily is taking notes. You, I am taking notes, yes. <laughs> you want to add on that? Um, well, I, I was just uh, started thinking uh, about this question of what happened next, you asked earlier, which I think is a very important question because it, it raises um, the uh, issue of, of history, or rather historicity, which is, um, again, itself part of a bigger issue, the issue of who are these people who are, who are being... Uh, represented, and I know I didn't want at any point, of course, in my talk to imply that uh, humanitarian organizations do not reflect upon their practices or don't try to do the best they can. But as I said, these are questions that are inherently unresolvable. How do you capture mental suffering, for instance? How do you capture the historicity of particular individuals just in a shot? Um, but as I said, instead of giving up, we should problematize constantly the way we present and try, uh, in one way or another, try to imagine new ways of bringing these big, big questions into, into uh, the photographic or the representational practice. So the question of you know, who these people are has to come into the communication of uh, humanitarian organizations. And it seems to me uh, that even though in the earlier ones it was there, but it was a very unsatisfactory answer. I mean, the emaciated children from the 60s is not really uh, the kind of imagery uh, we want to identify with people who are different from us and far away from us. But on the other hand, what is happening today with bringing uh, that whole category of people completely outside the frame of representation is also wrong, simply wrong for me. The people should be there. We need to know who they are. They need to have a voice as well. They need to be able to speak to us about you know, their lives, their challenges, and, and their um, actions. What do they do? What kind of agents are they over their you know, limited um, uh, livelihoods uh, that they have to manage? So we need to give them a, a voice much more than we do now. And on this, I want to go uh, to the question of new media. Um, what I wanted to say in my talk and what I think um, um, we should, uh, if you like, um, cultivate as a kind of um, a dominant attitude towards the new media in the field of representing distant others is a kind of cautious optimism. Um, on the one hand, yes, the new media do represent uh, new and um, important ways of um, interacting with humanitarian organizations and, and certainly giving voice to those who can handle the new media. They give voice, that is, to people who already have a voice, um, but they just find a new medium to communicate that to. Um, but we must also go back to uh, those communities of people who might not have those digital affordances and try to include them in that interaction. So the digital media should also be used as a way um, for the voice of distant others to be amplified and to be heard um, in, in the West. 
One very good example of that, I think, was a, um, a, website, a, pro a website that was part of a broader project, development project by the um, British newspaper, The Guardian, um, which uh, focused for a, a long period of time on the, a development uh, uh, program um, that was applied in a, in a village in Uganda called uh, Katina, the Katina Project and which routinely engaged the readers of the newspaper with local people in interactions online, but also uploaded lots of pictures, uploaded lots of local stories uh, um, that made um, our witnessing of what was going on there almost a daily activity and gave those people also flesh and blood. You knew who they were, and you could see development not, not only, only as a happy story. We go there and we, you know, uh, we uh, save people, or we've made these projects work, but also the difficulties, the challenges. There are incredible challenges that are frustrating both for organizations and, and for the locals. And, 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 you know, giving a kind of <coughs> a, real, a more real picture, if you like, of the complexities that are involved there. So I think the Katina project was a very good example of um, how the new media can be used to empower both sides of, of, the, of, the, of, of, the, of the story. I think I've talked too much already, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I haven't given voice to anyone else. And just to add, social media could help. It's very easy, you know, to give social media also to the other side. So it might help now to communicate from the different. Yeah, an example of, of that is uh, MS, uh, the MSF project uh, uh, TB and Me, when patients with tuberculosis um, are writing themselves about their disease and the challenges they face. So that's that's one thing that, that MSF has done. And I. I think that we should look, definitely look into the, that kind of project that you, um, that you spoke about even more. Um, we're starting a blog in a couple of weeks with some patients and staff of a project, an HIV project in South Africa, in, in Sweden, for example. So. Um, I think I'd like to, to, to open the discussion to the audience, um, if there are any questions. There must be people around with microphones willingly taking them. Yeah. No, that's okay. Uh, hello, my name is Aisha. I work for MSF Belgium. Um, I'm sure you've heard about this uh, kind of reality show that's been uh, filmed by an Italian NGO called Intersos and UNHCR about um, refugee camps, I'm not sure in which African country. And I just wanted to know what was your opinion about it, because it's created quite a lot of controversy. Thanks. I haven't heard the reality this, show. This was going to, to who? Do you know the reality show? I don't think we've we've seen it. <laughs> so <laughs> you don't know about it. Maybe it's very local. Yeah. Maybe it's not something that's been transmitted elsewhere. What do you think about it? <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> MSF Germany. My question is, um, I mean, if we, if we look to Syria at the moment, um, and, and there we basically rely on uh, the news from the ground, social media, uh, videos, pictures, uh, very difficult to verify. Um, I think this is a very new development. Can you comment on that? What is that? Is that changing your work? Is that um, uh, sort of also maybe changing the, the perception of how we see a conflict? I think this is for the photographer. <laughs> I've not been to Syria, so it's not changing my work. Um, but I think what, what you mean is like, like uh, a competition between different forms of, of reporting. Like uh, people putting photos and, and, and video on, on social media just by themselves, not 
um, not journalists or photographers who, who learned that, uh, that, that job. Do you see, that, that would be an interesting question, do you see a, a, a difference in the iconographies um, between um, real journalists, sorry, <laughs> and, and like, like citizen journalists or, or just people putting something up on, on social media? Yeah, I think it's one of the most fascinating developments in, um, in, uh, you know, in, in, in the field of media, uh, the way in which people are appropriated digital media and are using them for their own purposes, uh, both in Western contexts and, and, and also um, in, in, in contexts of conflict, like, uh, for instance, in Syria. Because I was talking about the um, that question of voice a minute ago, I would say that this particular example on Syria is an example where people are using the digital media to give voice to their own, um, to their own realities and their own concerns, and particularly in a country where uh, the official media were either shut down or disallowed any form of representation on the, from the ground. Um, the social media really made the reality of Syria uh, known to the world through the use of amateur videos by, by citizen journalists. And I think this is one of the very, very good things, one of the uh, most promising developments in digital media is that democratizing potential um, uh, that they have. And we saw it as well earlier uh, in, in, in the, the Arab Spring in Egypt, for instance. Um, but, uh, and, and also in disaster reporting, for example, I remember in the Haiti earthquake in 2010, how difficult it was for journalists to come in the field early on. Um, and for instance, the, the BBC journalists who covered the disaster actually arrived there more than 12 hours later. So the first 12 hours were uh, constant live blogging uh, from, from the NGOs that were on the ground and from locals. Um, in, in Haiti, so absolutely, you know, a fantastic use of the new media there um, in, um, at the service of, of um, informing the global public. But at the same time, we've got to, as I said, be very aware of the dangers and the ambivalence that are, uh, uh, if you like, um, um, associated with the use of, of, uh, of new media. Um, the example that I showed here of Action Aid is very different, of course, from the ordinary witnessing of the witnessing practices of um, amateur journalists. But it is another, if you like, radical use of new media to engage people in interactivity. It is just that it happens in a framework and within a particular philosophy of engagement that I think reinforces more a narcissistic engagement with us whilst leaving the voice of those people and their and, uh, the, and, and, and their presence outside the, the frame of communication. So I think there is always that ambivalence between, on the one hand, radical participation and, and global information flows, and on the other hand, ethnocentrism, narcissism, introvertness. And the new media can, um, can actually play both games. We just need to be careful about how we use them and what service we put them to. So I hope that's kind of... Thank you. My, uh, my name is Ilya. I work for MSF in Denmark. And um, I, keep, I keep thinking about, it. this is especially for Lily, um, that, that what you're talking about is that if you look at it from the side of the organizations, we become kind of a channel for the voices that we're trying to put out to other people to, to hear and to listen to. And it seems to me that we kind of recreate the divide between us and them. So there will always be some kind of victims or some kind of suffering in our communications. And obviously, as, as uh, Anna Karen also said, we're trying to, to do it in a way that, that is not just showing suffering, but also hope and that you can actually do something about it. And then, what we are constantly met with as communicators is the fundraising aspect. And I oftentimes hear that the pictures of a crying child is what's most effective. So I was just wondering if you have any comments on the tactics of fundraising in terms of the representation of suffering. Hope it's clear what I'm asking. 
Yes, it is, it is very clear, and I think it's, you know, it lies at the heart of the whole, um, you know, uh, question that we are discussing today about how you, how you present uh, distant suffering. And of course, you cannot dissociate that from the institutional context, and that is a context of um, uh, uh, particular agencies that belong to a, a larger market, and that market of competition, both for attention, for donations, but also for for, for funding from states or other organizations, um, uh, sets the terms for, or at least an important um, aspect of the terms uh, on which that communication uh, takes place. Um, and, and part of what I wanted to say today is that um, we need to be aware in that game of um, uh, fundraising and, and, and competition that is today uh, at a global scale, not to lose sight of, of the important issues. It is, it is, of course, paramount for these organizations to be able to survive and to be able to do well and to reach as many people as possible. But at the same time, there are certain, if you like, value issues that must not be compromised. And uh, my view is that uh, the self-reflexive style of the, you know, the ironic solidarity is, is compromising uh, too much um, uh, at the service of, obviously, um, raising donations or, or maximizing um, uh, membership in those organization subscriptions. Um, in fact, I think um, that the whole um, point behind those um, behind those, th th that style of campaigns comes from, as I said, from, um, from uh, borrowing from corporate organizations. I think it is pure branding, because with Oxfam and with um, ActionAid, what is being foregrounded in those messages is the brand, is ActionAid, it's Oxfam. It is neither the cause and the reasons why, nor the, uh, as I said, the people who they are and what their needs are. It's the connection of the donor to the brand. And this is at the heart of any form of corporate communication, particularly of mature markets. Mature markets are markets where um, the um, consumers already know very well what the brand is about. For instance, with Silk Cut, you don't need to have a cigarette and hear about how enjoyable it is to smoke for those who smoke and find it enjoyable, um, you just show the, you know, the silk cut. And you know what you're talking about, a very much your brand. Same thing with, I think, Amnesty International as well. You know, you just have to see the candle and you know what it's all about. So because now the communication of these organizations is precisely, if you like, taking on the features of uh, mature brands, um, the question of the other, and the question of justification are being marginalized because they are taken for granted. It is not because organizations don't want, don't believe that these people should have a voice or that justifications shouldn't be there, but because they're taken for granted. Again, following the, um, the corporate strategy of communication, which is say very little and focus on loyalty to the, to the brand. So this is the kind of reflexivity and awareness that I would like, um, you know, uh, to raise in relation to these issues. Yes, to fundraising, but where do we set the limits? And how can we perhaps incorporate those key concerns with effective uh, fundraising? But wouldn't you say um, that because what the brand is about is already known, there's room for communicating other issues? Because the brand is already known, um, yeah, perhaps you could reverse the logic and say, well, you know, we can now use time to raise uh, awareness. But I think, unfortunately, because of the scarcity of communication time, corporations work on the reverse logic, which is the less you say, the better. <laughs> and, and that is what's been going on with, um, I think, um, self-reflexive styles of humanitarian communication. Should I? Hello. Uh, I, I have a question for Isabelle. Yeah, I think, yeah. 
Um, my name is Tushar. I'm from Bangladesh. I would like to ask a question to Isable. I used to work for an uh, international news agency in my country uh, for part-time basis. As you said, you are a freelance journalist. And I went to cover a disaster situation at 2007. It was a cyclone at my country. It was a far remote than, uh, to capital. And we found uh, that uh, there are some sort of uh, international NGOs. They used to work and uh, they used to give some uh, emergency relief among the people. And they used to give some GM, genetically modified foods, and which is uh, strictly prohibited in our country. And uh, it was actually beyond my responsibility to cover this. Actually, it wasn't my duty. I was, I was there to cover the disaster situation. I used to send the reports and videos to the, my agencies. And immediately, I took that point and I reported to the government. I, we had, a, you know, the journalists have some lobbies to the government, and we complained. I complained of, uh, to the government, and they took the immediate decision. Then I received uh, serious repercussions from the yeah, international NGOs and from my organizations, too. So my question is, uh, do you think, uh, as a journalist or as a worker, like when we work for social media or some else, we, uh, should we maintain the thin line uh, considering, considering the local legalities and considering the humanities, like the, the concern about the GM food or like this? Uh, I think you, as a journalist, as a photographer, as a teller of stories, you have to presage your story. <laughs> Even if you do it for humanity or for press or for TV, you have to bring a very solid story. Uh, okay, sometimes, you know, the team is not comfortable, it's not the same point of view they want to tell you, but I think uh, it's better to always to keep one, um, one existence, one writing of the story. But I didn't catch the end of the question also, so. Um, no, my question was like, uh, it was beyond of my responsibility. It wasn't my responsibility. That was, was your that, duty. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it wasn't my duty actually. I was there to cover the entire disaster situation. Uh, but suddenly we found that uh, one of INGO, they're promoting genetically modified, mo modified food on that situation, which was strictly prohibited in Bangladesh. Oh, so and, they did something that is prohibited in Bangladesh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we, we uh, reported to the government, but it was beyond my responsibility actually. So when you were working, like when you were in, went to the Pakistan and, and with the assignment of, from international NGOs, you, you might, Look, some anything else like you uh, showed a picture. You want to highlight this, but they requested or they ordered to give uh, to highlight something more or something different. That's why I'm asking the question. Yeah, I I, I go back to the same point um, as a, a Bangladeshi photographer. I, you, you have your philosophy, you have the things you believe, you have the things you want to say, you don't want to show. You have, of course, the, 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 the Westerner who comes and, and, and don't, maybe don't respect the rules of your country. So you have to, to be aware that is, this happens and always keep in mind the story, you have to work on that. If you don't feel it, you don't do it. If you want to do it, you do it. <laughs> But um, after, this is, um, of course, there is always trouble in this work. It's never easy, like, <laughs> if I think if they, we want easy work, we choose another work, you know? <laughs> I know. But you have to be the guarant of your country also and of your land. <laughs> I have uh, actually two questions. Uh, question number one is, uh, I'm from Vision Hope. We work in the Middle East. For our last annual report, we compared the annual reports of the big organizations all sitting here. Like, yeah, I'm speaking. Like, I, I like try this. to speak inside. Like, like this. Yeah. yeah. And um, when we compare this, this work between, let's say, 60 and 100 pages, usually the annual reports, and in many of these reports, there were around 40 to 50 percent of the whole space was large-scale photos, of course, and a high quality. 
And I wanted to find out in question number one, what is too much? Because I've heard people saying kind of, this look very high professional, poster style pictures, but how does this belong to an aid agency? It looks more like a photo catalog or something like that. So could it be too many nice pictures, even though it's kind of the trend of what I've seen? So that's question number one. Question number two, um, we work in Yemen with malnourished children, so similar situations to the pictures we saw in the beginning. And because of security reasons, we have a lot of national staff there, also trained staff as photographers, and they would do very similar type of photos than what is completely not acceptable here anymore. But I feel a little bit strange now, like when I get 100 pictures, then to say 95 pictures are not acceptable, because in their minds they are completely acceptable. So it's kind of a new, uh, new Western style again. If I say, no, I don't accept these pictures at all, because our philosophy is that we show neutral children or laughing children, but not really suffering children. So how do we take, especially the ideas of local staff, um, seriously, and they want to present it in a different way? Yeah, I don't think it's an easy question to answer. Um, how to, um, th your second question in particular, yeah? Um, I think my personal view is, given the unresolvability of the question of representation, is that it is not a bad thing to show suffering as it is at all. And that, in a way, we live in a society that moves so far away from the fact that people actually suffer. They suffer away from our own societies, but they suffer in our societies as well. And the suffering in our societies is also taboo, mental and physical suffering. So um, I think it's part of a broader struggle to actually accept that there are different ways of being um, and that vulnerability is such a fundamental part of, of the human condition uh, that marginalizing it or even completely excluding it from the public spaces of representation is wrong for the kind of, um, you know, the kind of ideas of humanity that I believe we should be uh, engaging with and uh, we should be promoting. Um, so, um, I don't think that it would be wrong to go back to, to you know, your question, to actually show people who suffer. I think it is more um, the way in which that suffering is being portrayed, away from the neocolonial imagination of the solidarity, you know, the early forms of solidarity I mentioned, and also away from the more um, if you like, uh, imaginistic, pictorial representations of, of today. Um, a suffering that is contextualized, that gives voice to the sufferer, explains the conditions of the suffering, and tells us why things have to change. I have no problem with that at all. On the contrary, I, I would like to see more of it. We live in a society that is far too protected. <laughs> ah, the first question. Ah, yes. The first question was, why so many pictures? I think there are too many, or if they are too nice, and so on. What does the donor think about it? Because it only is $50, for example. Um, I, I, I don't know, you know, I can't really get into the kind of mind frame of those who actually produced uh, uh, those uh, reports. I would say, from my perspective and from the analytical framework I work, that I think, you, you mentioned the word catalog, you kind of compared it to a, a fashion catalog or... Um, I think it is again a kind of the influence of a corporate logic, a market logic into these forms of, uh, these forms of communication, these reports, um, that somehow glossy, big um, and explicit, uh, but kind of not very offensive images is what people want. I think it, there's an assumption about the market and the demands of the market that is being responded to um, in, in, in that particular aesthetic choice um, of, of, the, um, of the humanitarian reports. Um, again, I have no problem with many pictures, that's okay, but I think if the content and the format of the pictures is 
follows a particular market, uh, market imperative, um, then I would think twice about it. Um, you know, I think that um, pictures should be there for a purpose. They should be selected on the basis of particular criteria. And as I said, they should be contextualized properly. They shouldn't just be thrown in uh, for, the, for, 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 for purposes of aesthetic pleasure alone. I am very sorry, but I think we are well over the time and I get signs from the side that are scaring me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and people are already leaving, so... Um, I think there's one more announcement. First of all, thank you very much um, to the stage and uh, thank you very much to the audience. Um, I have to say one more thing because um, the program changed a little bit for tomorrow and uh, this is actually why Anna was so kind and took over for Marcel Metz, even who was actually supposed to be here. But uh, Jörg Ambruster cancelled for the Syria panel for tomorrow afternoon, um, which is why we swapped a little bit and Marcel took over for um, Jörg Ambruster and Anna for myself. So that's just a little announcement. Thank you. So thanks a lot and uh, have a good night.